Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. On the cross hung my pain and the guilt and the shame my Jesus bore my suffering to the grave to make me free. Oh, the blood that was shed, it now flows to cover sin. It was Jesus. 
Thank you, Jesus. Praise Him. 
Hallelujah. Give him praise. He's worthy. He's worthy. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise God. While you're standing, if you would turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16. Matthew, chapter 16. We'll begin at verse 13. Matthew writes, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? And they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? And this is the question that God is asking us today. Whom do you say that he is? Let's pray one more time. Lord Jesus, we love you. We praise you and we pray, God, that you would have your way in this place. Lamb of God, bless those that are gathered here, those that are watching on Facebook, those that can't be here. God, bless them with your presence. Let your love sweep over every member of this church family. I pray, God, that you would bless us, God, with wisdom, with knowledge, with understanding of you, God. Help to build that relationship that we might know you better, that we might be empowered, emboldened, Lord Jesus, that we might be strengthened by you. We love you, we praise you, and we pray that you would change lives in this place by the presence of your spirit and the power of your word. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. You may be seated. So who was Jesus? If you were in Sunday school this morning, um, you already got a start to what we're talking about. And I would, having said that, encourage all of you to come here and partake of the adult Sunday school that's available at 1030 in the morning because God uses it. Oh, we've got these books, right? And the books just kind of lay out a, a lesson plan, but... Um, but I thank God for, for ministers of God, like Brother Just, like Brother Wong, that will not just read what's in the book, but will seek after God and, and ask, God, what are you wanting to say to your people today? And again, if you were here this morning, wow, I, I hope you were a fast writer because I lost count, but there must have been at least... 45 scriptures, probably more like 60 scriptures that Brother Just rattled off, uh, just the references as he was going through his lesson this morning, and it would have behooved you to, to, to jot some of those down, because those scriptures tell us about God. He talked about the tabernacle, and talking about you know, these disciples that Jesus was speaking to, whom, whom, whom do men say that I am, he asked them. And the ones that he was asking about were the Jewish people of the time. And what they had was Genesis through Malachi and the teachings of the rabbis in the, in the synagogue. And, and they had vague ideas of what was to come. They knew about a Christ, a Messiah that was to come. But the references that they had were, were, were veiled, if you will. Something of a, a prophet that would come, a prophet like Moses that would be raised up and would come. Something about a restored kingdom, whatever that means. Maybe the Romans are going to be overthrown. Uh, there were lots of scriptures throughout the, the Old Testament prophecies through the writings of Moses as well as the prophets that pointed directly to Jesus Christ. But none of them specifically said, Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Messiah. And so many people at the time having just those Old Testament scriptures and the traditions that they had called upon for century after century didn't realize that the Messiah was standing right before them when Jesus came to them. All they had were those Old Testament prophecies, prophecies like Isaiah 9 and 6. When, when he asked them, who, who, who do they say that I am? 
I don't know how many of them reached back to the prophet Isaiah who said, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. I, I don't know how many people actually grasped onto that. Or, or, or Isaiah 7 and 14 that, uh, that told them that a, a virgin is going to give birth. How could this be? But you see, we've got more than they had. We've got so much more than these, these, these kind of veiled and, and vague directions that point to Jesus. We've got the New Testament. We've got the eyewitnesses, the ones that walked with him, the ones that heard him, the ones that partook of the miracles when he walked upon this earth. The, uh, things like Matthew chapter 1 and verse 23 where he writes, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Matthew pulling that, that scripture from Isaiah all the way forward, hundreds of years into the present, Telling them, this is the one. This is the one that was foretold. This is the one that's going to, to be your savior. The, things like John chapter 1. Who was Jesus? They didn't have John to tell them, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. They didn't have that. They knew that there was Almighty God, that He spoke the world into existence, but they didn't realize that that power, amen, that purpose, that plan of God would be manifest in a human being and walk upon this earth. The Word would be made flesh and dwell among us. Yeah. And we could behold, amen, we could behold Him in all of His glory, full of grace and truth, right here, right now in our midst. They didn't have that. They just knew that there was a God. And sometimes it was an angry God. Sometimes it was a jealous God. But they didn't know the loving God that would come and die for them on a cross. They didn't know him. Amen. The way that we can know him. We have something so special. I mean, they, it's, it's incredible what God has done for us. He's opened up. He, he, he tells us in John, I and my father are one. Jesus speaking. He's telling us exactly who he is. In John 14 and 9, Jesus said to Philip, have I been so long with you that, that, that you've not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. How can you ask me, show us the Father? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. How can we not know who Jesus is? How can we not know him? But so many people are still living under the veil. They still have their eyes clouded as if they were into the old covenant, as if all they had were, were vague scriptures and prophecies that point to something that they can't comprehend. But I'm here to tell you that you can know him. Amen. You can know him intimately. He revealed himself to us. Amen. Amen. And he wants to, if you haven't had that type of revelation, if you haven't had that type of relationship, God wants to do that for you today. Amen. He wants you to know him. Amen. As, as the writer of Hebrews says, the brightness of his glory. Jesus is the ex express image of the person of God. Amen. Praise God. He, he, he says in, in, in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God. Right. You want to see God? You want to see the one that spoke the world into existence? The only one you're going to see is Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus is the image of that invisible God. You can't see a spirit. God is a spirit, amen. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. But if you, if you are actually going to see God, what you're going to see is Jesus Christ, the man whom God manifests himself upon this earth in for one reason and one reason only, amen. He was a man who walked upon this earth. And as a man, he hungered, he got tired, he even got angry. He was tempted. The devil came to him and tempted him because he was hungry. He had fasted for 40 days in the wilderness and the devil came, why don't you just make these stones into bread? And, and Jesus had to, to fight the, the, the will of his flesh that said, yeah, I could do that. 
I could make these stones into bread and I could satisfy the desires of this flesh. But what he did was he, he called back to his own word and said, it is written, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Amen. Amen. He made a way for us, amen, because he was born as a human being just like us, but yet he didn't sin. He made a way for us to get back into the presence of God, to be reconciled to God. Amen. Jesus walked upon this earth, amen, and the, the, same, the same one who, who was tired and had to fall asleep in the bottom of a boat, is, is, that, that same man is the same God who stood up and said, peace, be still. And the, and the storm just calmed. He raised the dead back to life. Lazarus, come forth. Amen. Almighty God, robed in flesh, the power of God right here on this earth, walking, not so that he could perform the miracles, not so he could open blinded eyes. That's not why he came. Oh, those were all signs of his coming. Those were all to help those that, uh, that would look at him and see these, these miracles. Remember back at what Isaiah said, that the blinded eyes would be opened, that the poor would, be, would have the gospel preached unto them. Oh, he, he, he had all of those things that were written about him, and he revealed himself by those miracles, signs, and wonders. But that's not why he came. God Almighty came to this earth for a purpose. Wow. You're still trying to get your arm. I know there's, pe there's, there's people here that are still trying to get their arms around this. How can this be? Is he, is he a man or is he God? Or is he... Here's, what he, here's what Paul wrote to Timothy. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Who was manifest in the flesh? Who was manifest in the flesh? God was manifest in the flesh. Justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. God himself, the spirit that spoke the world into existence, manifest himself as a human being. Amen. And he came to this earth for a reason, for a purpose. And that purpose was so that he could be sacrificed for us. We've, we've heard over the last several weeks in Sunday school about the about the law being given to Moses and about the deliverance of the ch children of Israel from Egypt, all wonderful shadows of this spiritual kingdom, amen, and God taking us out of the bondage of this world into his heavenly kingdom, into his heavenly realm, amen, he's, he's, he's told us all about that, but Back there in, in, in Exodus when he talked about them being bound in Egypt, being, being, being enslaved and, and, and put upon by the world, the, 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 the whips, the scourges, the, the labor that was impressed upon them as slaves in this world, the heaviness that was, that was just brought down to bear upon them, God made a way for them to be delivered. And that last plague was death that was to sweep over Egypt, and every household would be touched by this death. But God made a way for the children of Israel. He said, I want you to go out and take a lamb and bring that lamb into your house. It's got to be a lamb without spot or blemish, and you keep that lamb for, for two weeks and make sure that there are no spots or blemishes that, uh, that crop up on this lamb, and, and after the end of those two weeks, I want you to, to kill that lamb. The blood of that lamb will have to be shed because it's that blood that's going to protect you. You take the blood that was shed by that sacrificial lamb and you put it on the, the lintel and the doorposts of your home and when the angel of death comes, it's going to pass over your home. Sounds kind of intricate. Why would God go to all that trouble? Why wouldn't he just kind of put his hand upon the, the children of Israel and, and say, that's all right, I'm not going to touch them. I'm just going to, going to plague the Egyptians. God did that because it was a sign, a shadow pointing to Jesus Christ. And in John chapter 1, the Bible tells us that John the Baptist was out in the wilderness baptizing and he saw Jesus walking over the, the, the crest of the hill and he said, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Jesus Christ was that lamb that would be sacrificed for us so that death would pass over us. He, he, he 
he suffered and he died for us and shed his blood so that we could have eternal life. The eternal life that God always wanted for us. All right, the garden was supposed to be forever for Adam and Eve. That, that fellowship with God, that relationship with God was supposed to be forever, but they separated themselves with sin. And that sin required a sacrifice. It required a death of an innocent, spotless sacrifice. A sinless man. The blood of Jesus Christ was what paved the way for us to go to heaven, praise God. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. It all points to Jesus. God wants so much for us to be reconciled to him. Paul wrote in in the book of Romans that God commended his love for us. He had so much love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We were bound in sin, and he died for us. Just like that poor little lamb. That lamb didn't do anything. The the nation of Israel was bound in bondage of of slavery in Egypt. And that lamb didn't have anything to do with the the slavery they were under. But that lamb had to die if they were going to be delivered from bondage. And that's what happened with Jesus Christ. He died for us so that we could be delivered. Amen. it's, it's, It's a beautiful picture that's painted. But we we have that. We have these writings of Paul. We have these writings of John. How can we not take them to heart? How can we not know who Jesus is? I'm asking today, whom do you say that he is? What does Jesus mean to you? Is it just a word? Are you just a Christian, a nominal Christian? Oh, I believe in Jesus. I believe that Jesus was the son of God. Well, well, good for you. Do you know what that means for you in your life? Do you realize, do you really realize that he died for you? Do you realize that, that being baptized is not just, a, just, just membership into some social club? Being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ is applying his name to you. That's why it's vitally important for us to take that name upon us. He died for us. Amen. The blood that he shed washes over us in the waters of baptism. And we apply that blood to our lives. We accept the forgiveness that he's given to us. Amen. It's Paul wrote in Ephesians that in him we have Redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. He shed his blood so that our sins could be forgiven. You've got to take that and internalize it. It's not just a story. It's it's not just a, a Sunday school lesson. Jesus died for you. He sacrificed himself for you. He took a bullet for you. This is what Jesus did for you. This is how much God loves you, that he would die for you. Who do you say that Jesus is? He came here for one reason and one reason only, and John tells us in 1 John chapter 3 that he committeth, he he committeth, he that committeth sin is of the devil, John writes. In, in 1 John 3 and 8, he that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. In Matthew chapter 18 and verse 11, Matthew writes, for the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. So what does that mean to us? God has had me in, in some, some passages in the Gospels over the last uh, few weeks and, and really, it kind of wraps up in Luke. We, we talked a little bit about uh, a man named Bartimaeus pulling from the Gospel of Mark, but I want to go to the Gospel of Luke to, to kind of tie this all together because it really, it really does make a difference. You see, Jesus came for you individually. And when I ask you, whom do you say that I am? I'm not asking you as a church. I'm asking you, Brother Carlos. I'm asking you, Brother Nathan. I'm, I'm, I'm asking you, Sister Doris. Who does he mean to you? 
to you individually because Jesus wants so much to have a relationship with you. I mean, yes, he died for all of mankind, but you've got to understand that it goes beyond that corporate redemption. He died for you. And in, in, in Luke chapter 18, we have this story of a, a, a rich ruler that comes to, to Jesus. We've talked about him over the last couple of weeks, a couple of times, how that he comes to Jesus and, and, uh, and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, you know the, the commandments. Don't, don't steal, don't kill, you know, don't, 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 don't commit adultery, love your mother and father. All these things, he says, all these things I've done from my youth. He's a religious man. He knows God's word, and he's ticked off all the checkbox. He looks the part. I'm sure that the disciples were looking at this guy and thinking, man, this, he's, he's going to be one of us. It look, how can he not be? He recognizes that Jesus is the one to go to, and he goes to Jesus, and he says, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? He's so close already. James and John were probably over in the corner conspiring on how they're going to stay the, the favorite disciples. And Jesus says, that's wonderful that you've done all these things. Now go and sell everything that you have, give it to the poor, and come and follow me. And the Bible says that man walked away sorrowful because he had a lot of stuff. And he loved his stuff more than he loved Jesus. Oh, me. How, how much do I love God? And, 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 and what am I willing to give to God if he were to ask me? This man was so close. You're not far from the kingdom, Jesus said. You're this close, but you've got one more thing that I've got to ask of you because there's a cost. I'm here to tell you that it's not easy being a Christian. It's not easy to have this relationship with Christ. I'm talking about a true relationship with Christ. It's not. Amen. Now, it's not easy living in this world either. Amen. The world will, will, will mask itself up, and the Bible says even the devil himself will change himself into an angel of light. Oh, he'll look, he'll look good. But, but next thing you know, you'll be wallowing in the mud on the side of the road, left for dead. That's what the world will do to you. But if you want to follow Jesus, there's a cost to be paid. I mean, it's, it's, it's not just a, all right, I'm going to go to church every Sunday and I'm going to get to dress up and people are going to like me and respect me. And that, no, it's about your relationship with God and recognizing that he's your savior, that he died for you. It doesn't matter what you're wearing. It doesn't matter how well you sing. It doesn't matter how much you give in the offering. He loves you. And he wants your heart. He wants all of your heart. We go from this man, this rich ruler who walked away sorrowful, right into another story of blind Bartimaeus. Bart had a, a need, and he, he knew that Jesus was coming and that, that, that this was his chance to have that need met, and there's a lot of people in this place that, that have a need for, that, 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 that they believe that God could, could touch them, maybe. But are you willing to, 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 to just not worry about what the rest of the world says? Are you worried uh, about what people will think about you? Are you maybe you're not going to be like Bartimaeus and shout out, Jesus, the son of David, have mercy on me, because that will bring attention to you. Maybe people will think you're just kind of a little flaky, one of those Jesus freaks or something. They, 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 they don't want to, they, you don't want to draw too much attention to yourself, so I'll just, I'll just go off somewhere into a corner and whisper a prayer to God and hope that he takes care of the situation. You've got to be like Bartimaeus. You've got to understand and believe that this is your only hope. This is your only chance. You can't let him pass you by. Don't let Jesus pass you by. Reach out to him. Don't worry about who's looking. Don't worry about how you look to other people. Worry about how you look to God. 
There's so many blind people in the world still today. Who do, Jesus, who do they say that Jesus is? They don't, they don't know him. They don't really know him. Jesus wants you to know him. He wants you to have a relationship with him. He wants you to be intimate with him. We've been there. We've been, we've been to this rich ruler and we've been with Bartimaeus, but I want to move on to this next, this next one because I think this is important and it really hits home. As we transition into Luke chapter 19, we hear a story as Jesus enters into Jericho about a man named Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, the Bible tells us, was a tax collector. And he was rich. He was one of the Jewish people who decided that he was going to work for the Roman government and collect taxes for them. Didn't make him very popular with his people. He was despised. He was rejected of his people. They hated him. They thought he was a traitor to his people. They would have killed him if they had a chance, if they thought they could get away with it. This is, this is who Zacchaeus was. But he was rich. He had all kinds of you know, wealth, nice place to live, nice clothes to wear, all of his needs taken care of, his physical needs. But there was something missing. Something was missing in the life of Zacchaeus. And he knew that he needed something, but he didn't know what it was, but he had heard about this man, Jesus. And Jesus was coming to town. I don't know how, the Bible doesn't tell us why he sought to see Jesus. All it, all it tells us is that he sought to see who Jesus was. And the Bible tells us that he was short of stature. You can almost take that in two ways. And yes, it means that he was, like me, vertically challenged. And I can, I can attest to the fact that that comes with some issues along the way. You're not going to be picked for the, for the varsity basketball team or the varsity volleyball team. You're not going to be out on the football field, uh, probably, doing a whole lot, except maybe uh, being a kicker. Um, but, but, but you know what? That wasn't the biggest problem that he had. I, I, I'm guessing that he probably had some issues as a, as a young man that he was kind of pushed aside because that, that might come with the territory on someone that, that isn't you know, strapping and you know, big and, and able to, to just take on anything that comes his way. But the biggest deficit that he had was his stature in society. He was looked down upon, hated by his people, but that's okay, the Romans loved him, right? No, no. Oh, he was doing the bidding of Rome, and he was collecting the taxes, but he was just another one of the Jewish dogs to them. They didn't, they didn't care about him. But, but he's stuck here in the midst. It, all he's got is his wealth, and his wealth wasn't. Unlike the rich ruler, that just wasn't enough for him. And he wanted to see Jesus, to see if maybe, if maybe, he could find what he was looking for, what self-respect, I don't know, relationship with God that he had lost. Because I'm sure as he grew up, you know, long before he was a tax collector, he heard about this loving God, this, this God who, who Isaiah said, has called you by name. But he was far from that God at this point. They weren't going to allow him into synagogue. They weren't going to allow him into fellowship. And so he's, he's trying to see through the press and, and the people are all there and because he's short, he can't get to Jesus. And so he, he runs up ahead and the Bible tells us he climbs a sycamore tree and just sits on a branch waiting to see Jesus. You see, there were some obstacles in his way. Zacchaeus had some obstacles between him and Jesus, and he was determined to overcome those obstacles. The enemy of your soul is trying to throw obstacles in your way each and every day. 
Sometimes that comes in the form of what looks like a blessing. Oh, I got that new job, but oh, wait a minute. I got to work uh, nights and weekends and, and, and overtime. And man, I'm blessed, but I got no time to, well, I can't really pray like I used to pray. And I'm, I'm missing church a lot. And oh, but, but, but you know, it, the bank account's looking really good. And maybe if I just squirrel up enough for, for, for that nest egg for later, I can, I can get back. But Jesus wasn't going to pass by Jericho again. It was, he was going through and he was going to Jerusalem to hang on a cross. This was his one and only chance to see the Messiah. People got in his way. And man, won't people get in our way? when it comes to trying to serve God, trying to see God, trying to build a relationship with God. Relationships, man. I, a pastor said one time, man, I, 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 I'd love being a pastor if it wasn't for the people. I'm, I'm just kidding. I love you all. I love you all. But what I'm saying is people come with issues. And anybody that has a relationship with somebody else knows that there are ups and downs and peaks and valleys and, and trials and tribulations that come your way. And, and it just seems to be magnified sometimes. And, 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 and it can become so huge an obstacle to us that it, again, turns us away from God. And we focus on a relationship with a person instead of focusing on a relationship with God and letting that Fix the relationship with that person. I mean, some things we can't fix. Sometimes we just got to build our relationship with God strong enough so that he's able to, to come down and bridge that gap. I mean, God is able. God knows, I mean, the end from the beginning. And while we'd like to think that we do, sometimes we get in our own way. And, and pride Pride can sometimes be our biggest obstacle. Again, what, what are people going to think of me? Uh, or, 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 or what status can I attain? Or, uh, yeah, it's, it's, again, it's not about us. I mean, it, it's about him. Amen. And if we can make it all about Jesus, and he's going to build that relationship with us, we will, we'll be so much better off. So, so here's this chief of the publicans and that's despised by everybody. He's up in a tree waiting for Jesus to come along. And here comes Jesus, and he just stops and looks up. And I wonder if this might not be the first time that, that anybody of any stature actually looked up to Zacchaeus, looked up to him, and saw him for who he was, saw past his short stature, saw past... His, his, his traitorous ways against his people, saw past who he was and looked at him as a living soul that God wanted to redeem, that God wanted to love, looked at him and called him by name Zacchaeus. And Jesus will do that for you. If you will find a place, just find a place where you can get close to him that's all he's looking for is, a, is an opportunity to reach out to you, to call you by name. He loves you beyond measure. You've got a God that, that, that loves you and wants to reconcile you to him. Oh, when, when Jesus called him, come on down here, Zacchaeus. We, we're going to your house. Jesus was fishing for an invitation, and it was a pretty, pretty open way of doing it. And he didn't say, is it all right? Would it be all right if, if maybe I came over for a meal with you, Zacchaeus? You know, we're eating at your house, Zacchaeus. Now, now, could Zacchaeus have said, whoa, time out here. I just wanted to see who you were. I, you're getting a little uh, pushy here, and I don't know if, I, if I'm all into this. But God was gracious and reached out to him and started to build that relationship, and all it took was Zacchaeus to open his door. Jesus was knocking on his door. Amen. Wasn't going to barge in. Wasn't going to kick the door down and say, where's the pantry? I'm hungry. No. What he said was, if you're willing, I'm going to come and dine with you. Would that be all right? Would that be okay if, if your Savior just decided to come and sit down with you and, and, and refresh himself with you? 
that's what Jesus wants to do. One-on-one. -on -one. Oh, I'm, I'm sure that there were many others there. I'm sure that there were the disciples of Jesus that were, that were tagging along as we call strap hangers, right? They're just trying to tagging along behind Jesus. Uh-oh, extra people. It's a good thing he's rich because it was probably you know, quite a costly meal that was, that was laid out here for all the disciples. And I don't know if anybody else, but I'm guessing that maybe some of the other publicans because it said that Zacchaeus was chief of the publicans. He wasn't just a tax collector. He was the, he was the head tax collector of the whole region. And, and, so, and so, yeah, there might have been some other tax collectors. And it said that people were just murmuring about this, saying, look at this. Wait a minute. We're out here to see Jesus. And what's he? instead of you know, standing up and giving a remember, we heard about that Sermon on the Mount. That was pretty powerful stuff. But, but he's, going to, he's going to eat with Zacchaeus. He's going to the house of Zacchaeus. They were, they were just... They, Maybe we got this guy wrong. Because Jesus didn't meet their expectations. Who are you looking for when you reach out to Jesus? Are, are you looking for somebody to just kind of ease your conscience a little bit? You're looking for somebody to say, okay, you're okay just the way you are. Don't worry about it. Jesus loves you. Everything's going to be okay. Is that what you're looking for? Because I'm here to tell you that that's not, that's not the God that we serve. Jesus said, you've got to take up your cross daily. And if there's a cost. There's a cost. And if you, want to, if, you, if, if you want God in your life, you've got to serve him. You've got to submit yourself to him. Yeah, there's that word. We're going to get to this in Ephesians after not too long. This idea of submission, that I'm not in control, he's in control. And, and, and all of this stuff that he's given to me, it's not because of anything I did. It's because of his mercy and grace. And if he wants it back, he can have it back. Yeah, that's right. Whatever you need, God, whatever you want, God, that's what I want. All I want really is a relationship with you. Zacchaeus invited God into his house. And Jesus, I, the Bible doesn't tell us what happened there. Doesn't tell us the words that Jesus spoke doesn't tell us what was happening at the meal. I'd like to think that it was just a casual conversation. That's kind of what God expects of us in prayer. Not a bunch of these and thous. I mean, not a bunch of groveling and whining. Just a conversation. Just, hey, God, thank you for being with Thank you for all that you've done for me. You're awesome. You're, you're, you're holy. You're magnificent. Thank you so much for what you've done for me in my life. I got some needs. I got some big needs. But you know what? If, if you could just take care of these needs that I have today, I know you're going to be here for me tomorrow too. That's, that's what God wants of us, just to talk with him. Just have a relationship with him. I mean, not, not from some 10,000-foot uh, throne that he's at, but right there, right there with you at the table. And the Bible tells me that Zacchaeus, whatever was said, it sunk in. Because Zacchaeus said, before this dinner was done, Lord, there's a clue right there, you're my master. I'm no longer serving Rome. I'm serving you. That, that is a good first step. When you realize who God is and you start serving him. Instead of those that are around you, don't serve. Instead of serving your job, oh, Jesus wants you to do well at your job. He wants you to, 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 to work on the job like you're working for him. But he needs to be first. He needs to be first and foremost in your life. And, and, and Zacchaeus said, Lord, I'm going to take half of my wealth and I'm going to give it away to the poor. That's, that's only half. Jesus asked everything of the, of the rich ruler. You know what? Jesus asks each of us for something different. Again, each and every one of us is different. He knows our hearts. He knows what's standing between us and him. And he'll ask us to get rid of it. And you know what? He actually desires us to go to him and say, God, help me to tear down this wall that stands between you and me. Sometimes we don't even know what it is. And David had a psalm where he prayed, God, if, if, if there's anything that stands between me and you, tear it down. 
If I've got secret faults and flaws in my life that I don't recognize, tear it down, God. Because I want you more than anything in this world. That's the relationship that God wants to have with us. So Zacchaeus said, I'm going to give away half of what I have. And oh, by the way, anybody that I've defrauded, because tax collectors, yeah, they weren't the, 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 the most honest of, of you know, people. They would take what Rome was owed and a little bit more for themselves. And, and he said, anybody that I've taken money from fraudulently, I'm going to restore to them fourfold, fourfold. And Jesus said to him, this day is salvation come to this house for as much as he also is a son of Abraham. Jesus came to bring salvation to all of us, but he came to bring salvation to us one soul at a time. Amen. He deals with me different than he deals with you. But what he wants us to realize is our desperate and dire need for him. In, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. If we can recognize who we are and our desperate need for Jesus, that is an awesome, awesome first start. In, in his heart, Zacchaeus knew that he was a sinner that needed God. He knew he wasn't right with God. Oh, he wasn't right with his people, and, and, and he wasn't right with Rome, and he wasn't right with himself, I'm sure. But first and foremost, he was not right with God, and he recognized that. And if you recognize that, that's only the first step. You've got to make your way to Jesus. No matter what stands in your way, if there's an obstacle, you need to run ahead and climb a tree. Whatever it takes, whatever it takes, you need to get to where you can see Jesus. If you'll do that, he will call out to you by name, and he'll help to build that relationship. Amen. We, we, we need to overcome those obstacles. We need to, again, you know, get rid of the pride. God resists the proud, the Bible tells us, but he gives grace to the humble. We need to, to, to let God know we're not worthy. I'm not worthy. But he, he's the one that made me worthy to step into the presence of God by the blood that he shed, the redemption that he gave, the forgiveness that he made available to me. In, in 2 Corinthians, we're, we're told by Paul, we, for though the, we walk in the flesh, we don't war after the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. We, we've got to understand that, that we're fighting a battle each and every day to get all of our thoughts and imaginations that are tied to this world out of the way so that we can reach out in the spirit and touch God. And... and Make no mistake that there are spiritual obstacles just as much as there are physical obstacles to you. And, and it's, not the, it's not the money. It is not the money that got in the way of that rich young ruler. It's the love of money. And this is what Paul tells us. The love of money is the root of all evil. There's nothing wrong with money. There's nothing wrong with having money as long as that money is not more important to you than, than God. But the minute that that money becomes more important than God, it becomes sin in your life. It becomes an idol in your life. What, what was the first, the first words carved in stone on that mountain? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And in this age, probably more than any other, idolatry is, is the biggest sin that there is. Well, wait a minute. Idolatry? I'm not, you know, out there you know, worshiping carved stones and wooden totem poles or no no idolatry is anything that you love more than god is really what it boils down to the bible tells us that uh, that that nobody nobody has an excuse we are all without excuse because the the invisible things of god are made visible by his creation we we know that there is a god but but then it tells us in romans chapter 1 that that the people of this world through their wisdom, became fools 
because instead of recognizing and realizing there's a God of all creation, we need to serve and worship him, they started to make idols. They started to worship the, the trees and the, the birds and the sun and the moon and anything that they could see and touch is what they, what they worshiped. But I'm here to tell you that God wants you to worship the one true God, the spirit, amen. The spirit of God that is even here in this place. You can feel him when we start to lift our voices to him and sing songs and, and give him praise. You can feel his presence. It's not just the songs. It's not just the words that come out of our mouth. It's not just those feelings on the back of your neck. I mean, you've got to go beyond that. You've got to seek a relationship with that God. You've got to understand, this is the one. This is the one that I need to approach. This is the one that I need to, to see one-on-one. -on -one. This is the one I need to have that relationship with. Amen. And, and we need to battle sometimes. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Paul tells us, but against principalities and powers and against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We, we have this spiritual battle that we're dealing with and we need to see it for what it is. And we need to pray that God would empower us. That where, where Paul tells us that in Ephesians 6, oh yeah, we're, we're gonna get there. How do we fight that battle? Amen, by putting on the whole armor of God, amen. That's, that's one way to do it, is to, to put on the armor of God. And, and, and the biggest thing that we can do is the same thing that Jesus did when the devil came trying to tempt him is to take the word of God. <laughs> Again, Brother David had so many scriptures today. I gave Brother Malcolm two pages of scriptures for this sermon this morning. God is trying to tell us something today. Get to know me. Run to me. Oh, you can't, you can't run to, to, to a spirit. Where, where is he? He's everywhere. Where can you meet with him? Meet with him in his word. Spend some time with him every day. Stand with me this morning. If you will open up God's word and spend some quality time with him each day, it's just like Zacchaeus running up ahead of the crowds, getting up in that tree. Now, I'm not talking about putting on you know, uh, a, a, uh, an audio King James while you're on your way to work and fighting your way through the traffic on 128. That's, that's not good enough. Uh, you, might, you might be able to pick up a little bit from that, but I'm, I'm not talking about you know, a, a, a put, you know, tapping into a, an audio Bible on your, on your iPhone and going to sleep with it, kind of playing in your ears. You know, that's all, all well and good as well. But uh, what I'm talking about is, is actually seeking after God. Time that's dedicated to Him. Oh, uh, how much time do we really devote to Him? How much time do we give him? You know, I, 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 would, I would venture to say that there's more people today that are entrapped, ensnared by, by their, their time constraints than that rich run, young ruler was constrained by his riches. I'm just too busy. I've got so much stuff going on. God knows that I've got all this stuff going I've got work and I've got home and the kids are doing this and that and everything that's going on. How can I possibly find the time? I'm here to tell you that if you let yourself get consumed by the things of this world, you are going to be just like that rich ruler and you're going to walk away sorrowful. You need to be like Zacchaeus and run away from the things of this world and get to where you can just find Jesus. Amen. Just spend some time with him. And, and you know what? The thing is, here's the, here's the thing. If you'll do that, if you will just make a crack in the door and allow him in a little bit, he'll free up your time. The more you give him, the more he gives back. We see it as a principle in our giving with finances. You give to God with your finances. You give back, I should say, to God because what you've got is his. You, you just give back to him as is the principle that he lays out and watch if he doesn't, the Bible says in Malachi, open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessings to you. With that same principle, it applies to your time as well. God wants to spend some time with you. He wants to spend some time with you in his word because that's where you're going to get to know him. That's where you're going to get, he's going to reveal himself to you. And when you'll do that, if you spend more time in his word, you're going to spend more time in prayer. It's, it's just going to happen. I don't know who God's talking to today. I have no idea.
but somebody in this place, somebody in this place has got some obstacles between them and God. And these altars are open right now. I wonder if you might just come up, lift up your hands, and, and like David, say, God, if there's anything, if there's anything that stands between you and me, tear it down. God, I want so much to build that relationship with you. Help me, Lord Jesus, to be whom you've called me to be. God, I want you to be my master, my Lord, my King. I submit myself to you, Lord God. Help me, Jesus, to have that servant's heart. 